is. Um, over to you, Terry. Thank you. OK. Um, so I'm coming to this topic from the perspective of a scholar practitioner. So I, I study these matters, and I also do practices, and I try to combine them. Um, and now, or let's say the last few years, I've been working uh, more and more on Buddhist meditation, uh, altered states called samadhis or the jhanas. Um, and I'm slowly sort of expanding my, my interest towards Tibetan Tantra. And I have this interest also for Western esotericism. My background is in, in philosophy. I've done work on, on Rudolf Steiner, anthroposophy, and so on. And I find that there's perhaps some conflict between these traditions. And as an old Hegelian, I like to try to unify things, which is kind of where I'm going with this as well. Uh, <clears throat> And I could easily talk about this for a whole hour. I've tried to compress this or make it more compact already. I had to throw out Freud, for instance, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but I'll try to get through this in about half an hour. Um, <clears throat> so if you look to the literature on Eros in Western esotericism, you'll find a bit. Uh, there's one book, Hidden Intercourse, by Hannah Graf and Kripo. Uh, one article on Crowley and Tantra. Um, there's one book there on sexuality and spirituality. There's not much, so much when it comes to Thanatos or, or death. But um, luckily, perhaps for, for me and my topic, they kind of intermingle if you look into the, the research as well. Here you can see, for instance, one article, The Little Death of Orgasm, um, which is about how there is a death experience also in sexual ecstasy. Uh, this can be measured and so on. Uh, and here I kind of come to the contradiction I'm going to explore today, where in certain esoteric traditions, spiritual traditions, you kind of go towards realizing the self. And in others, you go towards dismantling the self. And again, this can be measured, this is the research. Uh, and I'm trying to go then towards, I'm going to try to go towards uh, a perspective there where there's room for the self also within ecstasy. When it comes to these ideas, Eros and Thanatos, there's a lot of different things you can connect to them. Um, there's more to death than just absence. I mean, otherwise we couldn't really talk that much about it, say that much. And these are the kind of associations I'll be drawing on throughout this whole talk. Um, moving towards, again, this idea that there is some connection between the two. If you look deeply into death, you find something like life or eros and the other way around. Uh, <clears throat> and there is a conceptual dialectic as well. I think I'm going to skip this, but an maybe just rely on your intuition, maybe even experience, that these two are connected. Um, for instance, the whole thing that when you're go going towards a goal and actually realize it, that is the death of that eros, at least. And going to the Western esoteric tradition, you'll find this idea. Here is an Orphic bone plaque that's been found, a kind of a coin, where it's, where it's, uh, which says, Bios Thanatos, Bios Aletheia. So the truth is kind of revealed maybe through this process, and they were def definitely, uh, they had this idea that after death there's something you can do, and that's part of the revelation of, of truth. This is something I'm going to come back to now um, after I've talked about the concept of er eros in the, in the Western tradition. And this is the classic work, Plato's Symposium, which contains uh, speeches about what Eros is. And one idea is that it's a god, uh, as I'm sure you already know. And they, they connect Eros to Poros and Penia, two other gods, the god of abundance and the god of lack. So Eros is a combination of abundance and lack. You know? There's something that's missing, and there's a movement towards it. 
And then there's a whole range of different talks, ending with this idea of a ladder, Diotima's ladder, where you can climb up through the material world into the world of forms by relating to how eros, how beauty appears in the sensory realm. So it's, it's got this non-dual aspect that the forms show themselves, so you can actually go th to the truth through appearances. But the whole process, I can't go through all of this, is that you're basically moving away from the body as well. So the form of beauty will be found when you left the body behind. This is an ascending eros. So we go towards uh, the source of being, or the one. This idea is developed by the Neoplatonics. Um, Plotinus has the idea of emanations coming from the one, a kind of overflowing, and perhaps eros. And in Proclus, a later Neoplatonic, you'll find the idea that there's also a downward streaming eros, a descending eros, eros pronoeticos, which is a kind of providence, a kind of care from a being that's more perfect, uh, helping and lifting others up. And you end up with an idea of a circle of eros in the cosmos, one that's flowing from above through the whole manifest um, series of manifestations, basically the intellect, the soul, and the bodily world. And then there's a reversion uh, where the manifestation tries to go back to the source. Um, and you'll find this to, to some extent also developed in the Christian tradition with the transformation of Eros into agape, so a love that's directed towards other fellow human beings, other beings. That's kind of a connection between this um, divine Eros and the earthly Eros. In the love of your neighbor, you're basically also manifesting divine love. So there's some kind of horizontality there as well. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm coming to Ficino now in the Renaissance and an attempt at writing the symposium again in a way. Um, in the book called De Amore. Again, a series of speeches about love. Um, <clears throat> and you get this combination of divine arrows or ascending arrows and descending arrows. Um, and this is f further than developed in other philosophers, Leone Ebreo, a Jewish philosopher, that talks about a female and male aspect of God, which leads, when they meet, it leads to the creation of the world. And then you... Um, get to the idea that even in human sexuality, there's some divine element, uh, which kind of goes again against uh, the Platonic tradition where the body is seen as something lower. It's very clear in Ficino when there's talk about how uh, the one shows itself in harmony between two different things. And you can't really get this in the sense of touch, and the sense of uh, taste, and so on. So in order to approach the one, you really need to uh, move away from, from the body. But the tendency I want to point out here is that there is some kind of lifting up of material eros as well, throughout the tradition. And I think this is where you, what, what gets you to this, this kind of literature. Uh, there's a whole plethora of different books exploring sexuality in the context also of spiritual practice. It's a fascinating area. I can't go into it that much. Um, other than to say this is kind of in the tradition, but actually how to do it, it's a bit more difficult. And if you go into this literature, you'll find also that the, the draw on at least some of them uh, tantric aspects. And this is what I'll end with after I've talked about this, death, Thanatos. Yeah, and we can start with Plato here as well. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard about uh, the idea that philosophy is a training in death. The idea is quite simple. If the world of form is illusory and death moves you away from the material world, then death could be the revelation of truth. 
So you get the idea of descending into Hades and finding what you really are looking for as a philosopher. Some kind of revelation of the forms then in the afterlife. That death as a spiritual practice also gets um, integrated into the Christian tradition. This is um, John Climacus's work, The Ladder of Divine Ascent. Again, this idea of moving upwards towards God, but also then dying to the material world. Um, obedience is a total renunciation of our own life, he writes, death freely accepted. But of course, you are looking for some kind of resurrection to uh, true reality. That's at the end of that process. So in a way, then, it's an eros that leads to death of the material aspect and unification with the divine. That, again, is sort of the full realization of this ascending eros. Um, here's a quote from the Cherub Journeyman of uh, the... I think it's a German mystic, Angelus Alessius. So if you die before you die, then you won't die when you actually die. But if you don't practice death before you die, you'll die and rot. So again, you'll find this idea also of death as a kind of practice. That's a kind of preparation also. And <clears throat> paradoxically, death is often presented in a way that's personified even perhaps some kind of longing in death or towards the figure of death as a kind of liberation perhaps from, again, that would, uh, would be the Platonist perspective, from a world of matter that's illusory. Buddhist perspective maybe something like there's suffering and we want to move away from that and cessation would be the final liberation. And so we're kind of moving uh, towards the connection between Eros and Thanatos. It's a, I don't know, maybe in these circles, well-known quote by Desad. There's no better way to know death than to link it with some licentious image, an erotic image. And I think you can twist it a little twist this a little bit and say that you can also just connect it to an image of religious ecstasy. And the classic here is, of course, Teresa of Avila, uh, where she describes a state where pain and pleasure or infinite sweetness, as she says, intermingle in the state of ecstasy. And this brings us to Bataille. Probably the philosopher that's worked most deeply on this topic. And his core ideas are continuity and discontinuity. So as a human being, you're isolated in a way. There's a disconnection between you and reality. And this is the basis for eros or desire. You long for continuity. And of course, then it's quite easy to connect that to death as a sense of negation of the isolation. Death brings continuity. Uh, I'm not actually sure how that is to be understood. The quote that Bataille uh, use, uses in the context, for instance, when, when it comes to human sacrifice, that is experienced by the onlookers. Yeah? There's a before and an after, and they're connected. But as far as I know, it doesn't talk about the experience after death as something, as a real possibility. So there is a kind of materialism that comes into this, comes into play here. Uh, you see this also in the work of Ludwig Klages, who's written on the cosmogonic eros. A kind of neo-pagan philosopher, you could say, Nietzschean. Uh, one of the first to start to really criticize rationality, the intellect, and wanted to Mm, draw ecstasy back into the way we conceive of reality. The way he unpacks the idea of ecstasy is connected to an un unselfing. So the self has to go away in order to experience ecstasy. Here's a quote which I find interesting. Uh, ecstasy, this is also, an, uh, in his view at least, an antique uh, uh, idea of eros. So it contains its complementary whole. So that means that eros, or ecstasy, is self-containing. It 
brings itself about. It's both active and passive. So I find that interesting because that's exactly how we can define the self if we go to Nietzsche even. We want to become those who we are, the new ones, the unique ones, the incomparable ones, the ones who give laws to themselves, the ones who create themselves. Self-creation, again, if we go to Klages, uh, ecstasy, passivity and activity at the same time, shaping yourself. So I don't see that all conceptions of the self, at least, has, has to be uh, standing in the way of the realization of ecstasy. Actually, we could conceive of the self as a kind of ecstasy. Uh, I've indicated this already. Um, the idea of a higher self or the holy guardian angel in the Western esoteric tradition is central. Can't go that much into it. Um, but there is, um, how would I put it? Self is something positive. I guess that's the basic idea. And I think you can understand the self uh, proceeding from this tradition in this way. It's a kind of connection between Eros and Thanatos. You have the idea of a pure individual, unique, undefinable, but unique. It's aware of everything that's go going on, but it doesn't have any qualities itself. So in a way, it's stillness, it's unmoved changing, it's Thanatos. And then you have the narrative self, the life story, the aims you have, and so on. And throughout this whole process, the individual remains the same. And maybe even it's realizing itself as something that's beyond or even uh, dead in a way, in the, in the sense of purity and individual uniqueness that's realized through this engagement with Eros. Um, so, that's kind of my argument for understanding the self as a unity of Eros and Thanatos on a conceptual level. And then I want to go to this idea of um, deepening both as actual spiritual practices. Um, not just the idea of preparing for death, but actually dying. Not just, I don't know, philosophizing about the one but developing the Eros that's also materialized, going towards the even stronger connection between Eros and Thanatos, again, as a realization of, of a self. This is basically the questions I have here, um, which bring me to, brings me to the final part. <coughs> Tibetan Tantra. Okay, so... <coughs> It's a whole field of research in and of itself. It's not that easy to say um, with a short definition of what Tantra is, but my suggest suggestion is that it's mm, using special means that brings about awakening more quickly. It's about speeding up the process of enlightenment, awakening, using things that are usually seen, seen as opposites to awakening, the poisons of consciousness, aggression, and desire. So they develop practices or have developed practices drawing on the Indian uh, tantric tradition and integrated that into a system using, as it says here, a book by Yeshe on inner fire, uh, the Tumo energy, which is a tremendous energy, and it's possible to cultivate it. And this is done within what's called the Six Yogas of Naropa. I can't talk about all of these, but I'll focus on the first and the last, because they're directly connected to Eros and Thanatos. So the Yoga of Inner Heat would be, again, Tumo. The energy that's sort of... Uh, intermingled with the life processes and processes of reproduction. And the yoga of the intermediate state would be the yoga of death. Practices done that bring you towards the death state or even done as you're dying. And these go uh, from the top to the bottom in a way. Uh, and this, you start with arrows and end with death, to put it uh, in, in, a, in a succinct way. So the idea, again, you cultivate the energy of eros, of desire, and as you do that, you'll go towards 
uh, a realization of the clear light that's a primordial consciousness. Um, the practices consist of visualizations, um, breathing exercises, and energy manipulation, you could say, but also karma mudra, which are actual sexual practices. They're not seen as absolutely essential. Uh, they can be done physically or in the mind. And the idea, again, is just to speed up the process because uh, that really strongly activate the, these energies that are supposed to go through an alchemical process of, of purification, I guess you could say. Again, highly in um, opposition to more classical Buddhist conceptions. There's an article that I've written about this, trying to navigate that space where on the one side desire and hatred are something to be rejected as you're going towards awakening, and the other conceptions where these are seen as vessels or energies that can be transformed uh, to quicken the process. Yeah. Okay, so, and there's, um, I have some time still. Uh, some research that I want to go into towards the end here, which is very fascinating to me, uh, and it's the research on the state of Tuktam, which is the f uh, final level of practice that I spoke about earlier. It's done uh, at the moment of death, and you basically take the light that appears on death as a meditation object. And again, using the Tumo energy, you actually are just, you're starting the death process as you're alive, and you will go towards this state. And if you practice that enough, you can also do it at the moment of death. And what happens is that people go into, I'm not sure how to describe it, a kind of hibernation. So they can stay in this state and moving for days, a week, a week, maybe even more. Uh, completely unmoving, and there's no brain activity, and no decomposition of the body as well. There's a documentary if you want to look into this, uh, but very much then a connection, or actual connection of the practice of Eros and Thanatos. And um, as you go then deeper into this state, you'll get into what is called the clear light, or different shapes of this light, but the final state is the clear light, and that is um, present in every sentient being's continuum. It is flowing continuously since, since beginningless time without a break even for a single moment. Its nature remains untainted by pollutants. Since the pollutants, the poisons, greed, hatred, and so on, arise from inappropriate attention as their condition, they are adventitious in that they are separate from the clear mind. So, mm, reading this, I feel that Plato would agree in part with what the clear light is as a primordial nous, mind. Um, what I'm asking myself is, how can this be a non-dual principle, a final principle that doesn't contain duality, um, if it's untainted by the pollutants? It's kind of crystal clear, and the poisons are outside of it. And it is said that the, sort of the, the reincarnation process or the cosmic process starts when there's ignorance coming up again, when the mind doesn't realize itself as clear light. But to me, that sounds like a dual process again. There's something that's not harmonious, let's say, with, with, a, with a clear light. You need another principle lack of attention, ignorance, misidentification in order to sort of start the cosmic process again. So what I'm wondering is whether there's some way of combining these two perspectives, kind of platonizing this whole idea of the clear light, where this restarting of the process is more like an emana emanation that isn't really disconnected from how the self is realized. Uh, yeah, so I'll leave that uh, as, a, as, a, as an open, open question, adding perhaps uh, something on the samadhi states that's ex uh, experientiable uh, even long time before, before death. So the samadhi states are states of effortless focus. 
I'm sure a lot of tried out meditation and you typically experience that attention doesn't stay for long at an object. Uh, in order to proceed from that, you really need to stabilize attention. And you could say that that's a strong activity of the self. Following a rule, making consciousness dead in a way, unmoving on the one object. What's interesting is that at one point, you, this will turn into a blissful state. So through this deadening of attention, you could say, there's a clarification and a reintroduction of bliss. And this can become very embodied, and interestingly, you'll get a unification then of Eros and Thanatos in the Samadhi state. Uh, so I see, see this as a sort of real potential that's experientiable in meditation. It doesn't really contain any dissolution of the self. There's complete awareness in these states. Uh, there's no narrative thought going on. It's, it's clearly possible to be aware of what's going on. And I think this might be extended also into um, other even deeper states. So um, I'll end there. It's really fun to be here. Uh, coming to our culture is, I feel like this is the place where I can just speak about exactly what I want and say it in the way I want. And people hopefully understand it as well. So thank you. Okay.